Hello, in this video, I'd like to look at the different measures of money market yield. So that's the at least four different ways that yield can be measured in the money market. When we say money market, we distinguish between money market and capital market, where the big difference is time. Specifically, the money markets are short-term markets. These are financial instruments that are tied to an interest rate, whether that interest is paid or imputed, and the maturity is one year or less, as opposed to capital markets, here, the maturity is greater than one year. So the most obvious example of capital markets would be stock issued by companies or long-term debt, like a long-term bond with longer maturities. Then in the money market, that being the market for short-term debt instruments, it includes treasury bills, also called T-bills. So that's short-term debt issued by the government, which tends not to have a coupon. Commercial paper, that's debt, short-term debt issued by companies and certificates of deposit. Not on my list here is a huge part of the money market, which is repurchase agreements, also called repos. For market terminology, we have the face value of the instrument, like a T-bill. So if we think about the analogy to long-term bonds, the face value is just like the face value in bonds, which we also in that world call the par value or the principal value sometimes. And then the discount from the face value, which constitutes the interest. So then if we look at the measures, there's fully four measures. In this section of the CFA, there's actually five yield measures listed. So it is confusing sometimes, including this one at the end, bond equivalent yield. It's here in the syllabus in the section, although to my knowledge, this is more applicable to the capital markets, specifically long-term bonds, either government or corporate, where we definitely use bond equivalent yield a lot. Okay, but that's five to look at. If we look at the bond discount yield, so money market instruments, also called discount instruments, are quoted this way on bank discount yield, where the yield is expressed as a percentage of the face value. And so this can take some getting used to it if you haven't seen it before. But for example, if we today, for a treasury bill, if the cash price here was $99,000, these are short-term, effectively zero coupon bonds. There's no coupon. We're paying $99,000 today. We're waiting 120 days. And then we get back the face value of $100,000. Just two cash flows, very simple. How would you express the yield that way? Well, by convention, this big dink discount yield does it this way. Discount divided by face value. So in this case, you can see the discount is $1,000. That's my D. Divided by my face is $100,000. So you can see here, we've got 1%. The discount as a percent of the face value is 1%, and the 1% is annualized. And you will notice, if you're familiar with day count conventions, this is on a 360 day count convention. Doesn't necessarily need to be that way, but that's what it is here. And in this case, I use round numbers. so. This is a three. The 1% is annualized by multiplying by three because there are three 120 day periods. And so we're getting the 3% as the discount yield. If from an investor perspective, that doesn't quite feel like an, like an accurate measure to you, then very good observation because it's not. It's just a conventional way of representing this price as a, in terms of its discount from the face value, not as a function of the price paid, which of course is what we care about. So that's bank discount yield. The problems are, as noted, the yield is based on the face value of the bond, not its purchase price. But of course, investment returns should be evaluated relative to the amount that is invested. And as noted, the yield is annualized based on a 360 day, that's the day count convention that is selected rather than a 365 day year, which of course is the actual amount of days in a year. And finally, the bank discount yield annualizes with simple interest and ignoring the opportunity to compound. So that would be a hard thing to notice on first glance, but that's an annual, right? Multiplying this by 360 to item of the T is not compounding at all. It's just what I would say is it's naively annualizing without doing any compounding. Okay. That leads or segues into the holding period return, holding period yield, which 
I don't like using yield in this context. I would prefer they call it holding period return so we don't confuse it with our yields. But the holding, because the holding period return or yield, that is an essential fundamental building block in terms of computations. But the thing about the holding period yield is it's indifferent to the time frame. You'll notice time does not show up on here. So it's simple by definition in this case. It's the price at the end of the period, subtracting the price at the beginning of the period. In this case, there's no dividends in general with these money market instruments. So we've just got that in the numerator, the price appreciation divided by the initial price. So this could also, of course, if the dividends here are zero, this is also the same as taking my ending price at the end of the period, divided by price at the beginning of the period, subtracting one. And again, we looking at this, I stripped out that assumption of 120 days because it's not part of it. The holding period return, therefore, is not annualized, therefore, has no compounding. And by itself, we really do need to be told, if this is 1.01% as a holding period yield, we really do need to be told over what period of time, in this case, 120 days. So that's the second of the five that we look at. Okay, that gets us to the effective annual yield. And now we've actually remedied that problem in the holding period yield, that it had no time information. We take one plus the holding period return, and notice we raise to the power 365 days using actual days. So we are compounding this holding period over whatever the number of appropriate compound frequencies in the year to, to retrieve an effective annual yield, which is, because of this, it is a useful basis for comparing because it's all in a one-year time frame. And you can see here, by definition, it includes the compounding although it compounds at the frequency of however many holding periods there are in any given year. So in our case, the holding period return of 1.01%, approximately it's a little bit more, there's a little bit more than three of those periods in a year. So I don't know what to call that. It's more frequent than semi-annual compound frequency, but it's less frequent than quarterly compound frequency. But it's three periods per year that we are compounding it to get an effective annual yield of 3.104%. Alternatively, this gets to the fourth definition, money market yield or CD equivalent. It's also, you see here, a function of the holding period return. Just so I'll go back to the uh, effective annual yield. Effective annual yield, right, compounded our holding period return to retrieve for us an effective annual yield. The money market yield also takes that holding period yield return, but notice it just annualizes it, or I would say naively annualizes it by multiplying by 360 divided by T. So useful in the sense that we also get a per annum number, in this case 3.03%, but it's not compounded. So we should expect, I think always, but let's say in general, for the money market yield to be less than the effective annual yield simply because we just scaled it. We didn't include the compounding. So that's the four that we care about. If we get our handle around these, we've mostly covered what we need to know about market, money market yields. And let's recap. Imagine we pay today $99,000 for this money market instrument with a guarantee that we're going to get back $100,000 at the end of 120 days. What are the ways to measure that? Well, the first one is just by convention how it's referenced. It references a discount yield of 3%. And that's because we're, there's $1,000 difference between what we're paying and what we're getting back. And, but that's only over 120 days. So if we scale that over a year, it's 3%. But the problem is, so it's annualized 3%, that discount. But the problem is that's 3% of the 100, which is not what we're paying. We're paying less than that. So this is 
nothing, this is not a measure, any measure of true yield. It's understated any measure of true yield because that a truer measure of yield would be a function of our purchase price. Then we have the holding period yield, which is not annualized and is just a simple matter of what's the percentage simple return on our payment over the period without respect to time and therefore without incorporating any compounding. And then we have the two measures here, which both do take that holding period yield, which is true in that sense of a shorter period, and they both convert these into per annum yields, and therefore they are both more truer or more correct than the incorrect discount yield, but they are different. The effective annual yield will compound that holding period return, whereas the money market yield or CD equivalent will merely annualize it, or I would say merely scale it and ignore the compounding and therefore will be less. And so it's one of these that is closer to the truer yield, and it's probably the effective annual yield. Finally, bond equivalent yield. As mentioned, I've included only because it's in this section in the CFA syllabus. Otherwise, I would associate it with capital markets and long-term bond. But the bond equivalent yield is really just a special case of the yield to maturity. When we say yield in capital markets, we mean yield to maturity. And the yield, the compound frequency on the yield, if it's discrete, can be monthly, quarterly, annually. But the bond equivalent yield is just that special case of discrete compound frequency when it's semi-annual, which tends to often but not always be the case with long-term bonds. So again, bond equivalent yield is a yield for a bond when the compound frequency is semi-annual or we have two six-month periods per year. And my example here would be let's say a five-year bond that pays a semi-annual coupon where the coupon rate is 6%, always expressed per annum on this, and the price is $98.50. The point of the bond equivalent yield is this is in general, and in the case of an exam, this is almost always how we want to express the yield, which is to say, I'll use my calculator here to do it, this is the very typical pattern here for completing the yield, the bond equivalent yield for this coupon. I'm going to go right here to time value money keys. N is my number of periods. Semi-annual, it's 5 times 2. We have 10 semi-annual periods. N equals 10. Then I go to the, my present value is my price, 98.50. I like to do my negation right here for my price. The payment is a $3 coupon every six months. So three is the payment. And my future value is 100. And then I compute my yield. And I get a correct yield, but it's for my the period. I had 10 periods. My period is six months. So my six-month yield is 3.1774. That's accurate but it's not how would we, we would communicate it. We want to communicate here the bond equivalent yield. We want to annualize it by multiplying by 2, and I get 6.3549. And you can see that's my more accurate version of what's rounded here on the slide. So it is a number we could say that's uh, it's a per annum. That's how we want to give it as an answer or communicate it. And specifically, that is 6.355% per annum with semi-annual compound frequency would be a long way to say it. So that's it. That's the five yields. And I think that's enough. If the video is helpful, then you know I'm going to ask you to subscribe to the channel so you get notified of my next video and videos, plural. Thank you.